So moving into some neuroanatomy, let's start with the surface of the brain. So if you just look at the surface of the brain, what you're going to see is a number of what appears to be little ridges and valleys. These are the gyri and the sulci. The gyri are the bumps. Gyri is plural. Gyrus means singular bump. Sulci are the valleys, and sulci is plural. Sulcus is singular. And when you look at the surface of the brain, what you're looking at here, the tissue on the surface of the brain is known as the cortex. And the cortex is where all our very high level cognition, sensory processing, motor processing takes place. So the cortex is a very important part of your brain. And the purpose of the gyri and the sulci, if you look at it, you can see that what the gyri and the sulci are is the cortex that has been folded up so that it can fit into the small surface area of the skull. So by folding the cortex, it allows the human body to fit more cortex within a smaller amount of space. All right, so for example, here's my skull. Take off the skull cap. Let's say this is my cortex. Now the amount of cortex that I could fit into the skull without folding is going to look something like this. Right? But if I'm allowed to fold my cortex, then I can get the entire sheet of paper in there. And I've got room for a few other sheets of paper in there as well. And that allows that folding of the cortex into the gyri and the sulci is what allows us to pack enough cortex within our skull to have normal cognition and normal functioning. There are conditions that is known as smooth brain syndrome, where babies are born without gyri and sulci. And if you see uh, MRIs of their brain, it's just smooth. And these kids are severely impaired and typically don't live very long because they have so little proper neurological functioning. So aside from the gyri and the sulci, you have some deeper divisions within the surface of the brain that creates, that divides the brain into different sections. Looking at this image right here, you have this deep sulcus right here. I've already got it highlighted. That is known as the lateral sulcus. It's also known as the sylvian fissure. And there is a deep fissure that runs front to back in the brain. And this is known as the longitudinal fissure. And the longitudinal fissure divides the brain into left and right cerebral hemispheres. And if I take the brain, if I turn it sideways, there is a third fissure that runs coronally across the surface of the brain, and that is known as the central sulcus. And here is an image which we can illustrate the central sulcus and there is the lateral sulcus. In front to back, you have a longitudinal fissure. So the longitudinal fissure divides the brain into left and right halves, which are the left and right cerebral hemispheres. Beneath 
the cerebral hemispheres. There is a large band of neurons that connect the left and the right hemispheres. This is known as the corpus callosum. If we were to look at a sagittal slice of the brain, so this is anterior, this is posterior, and this would be the right cerebral hemisphere. This would be right here. There's your right cerebral hemisphere. And here you have the corpus callosum. You can see where the corpus callosum is sagittally beneath this right cerebral hemisphere. Now, if we look down on the brain, so now we're looking down on the brain, so this would be anterior right here, this would be posterior, and you can see illustrated beneath here the all these fibers, these neuronal fibers that are connecting the left and the right hemispheres, that is the corpus callosum. And you can see that if we follow this line that starts right here, we're going to end up at the analogous area in the opposite cerebral hemisphere. So that is what the corpus callosum does. It connects similar areas of the left and right hemispheres to each other. So that as you're thinking and doing things, each the left and the right cerebral hemispheres can communicate with one another. And it is their ability to communicate with one another that allows us to operate in a neurologically normal fashion. So to give you an example, you probably are aware that the left hemisphere, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and your right hemisphere, the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. And this is true. So when I go to tie my shoe, my hands are operating very much like they're in coordination. It's like each hand knows what the other hand is doing when it's doing it. And that's true because that's literally what's going on because as the left hemisphere is controlling your right hand to tie your shoe, and as the right hemisphere is controlling your left hand to tie your shoe. They're also talking with each other to make sure to monitor what the other one is doing with the opposite hand so that you're able to appropriately do it. And to prove this, you can close your eyes. And when you go to tie your shoes with your eyes closed, you will still be able to tie your shoes normally because even though you can't see what's happening, each cerebral hemisphere is sharing the information of what's going on with the hand that it's controlling with the other cerebral hemisphere in order for you to normally accomplish the tying of your shoe or walking or playing basketball or whatever else it is that you're doing. Okay, to prove this to you, here's a video of one of my old student students tying a shoe with her eyes closed. All right. So as you could see, she had no trouble doing that. She had her left hand being controlled by the right hemisphere and her right hand being controlled by the left hemisphere. And as she was going about this task, each hemisphere was talking to the other hemisphere, communicating with the other he hemisphere, allowing each hemisphere to know where the other hand was in space and pulling off this rather complicated motor ability. So now let's take it to the next degree. Let's have the same situation, which is we'll have a right hand controlled by a left hemisphere and a left hand controlled by a right hemisphere. 
but we're not going to allow these two hemispheres to talk to one another. And we're going to model this by having two students with their arms interlaced complete the same task with their eyes closed. Is, Is it working? working? <laughs> 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 I tried to make my own. Great demonstration. So you could see that without the corpus callosum connecting the two hemispheres, normal operation becomes very difficult. All right, so divisions of the nervous system. You have your central nervous system. This is the brain and the spinal cord. You can easily recall the central nervous system, what it includes, because the central nervous system is encased in bone. Contrast that with the peripheral nervous system, which are, which is composed of your peripheral nerves, which are the nerves that run from all the parts of your body to your central nervous system or from your central nervous system out to all the different parts of your body. And we divide these nerves into the cranial nerves and the cranial nerves is that part of the peripheral nervous system that is associated with the head and the neck and the spinal nerves, which is the part of the peripheral nervous system, which is associated with the rest of your body from the neck down. So if I were to draw, well, he's going to turn out to look like Gumby, but if I draw a little guy here around this nervous system, you would see all these nerves that are coursing out from the spinal cord out to the body or the nerves that are coursing from the body back into the spinal cord. Below the neck, we refer to them as those nerves, as the spinal nerves. Above the neck, those are the cranial nerves. And if the cranial nerves are the nerves that innervate all of the structures of the head and neck. And if you think about the structures that a speech therapist is largely concerned with, most of those structures that as an SLP we worry about are associated with the head and neck, then it becomes evident that we are highly concerned with the correct operation of the cranial nerves. The brain has three protective layers between the cortex and the inside of the skull. These are referred to as the cerebral meninges. The cerebral meninges have different functions. The most superficial is the dura mater. And if I scroll down here and you see this image right here, that is a picture of a dura mater that's been taken off of the brain. The dura mater is very tough. It's very fibrous. So if you picked up that piece of tissue that I just circled, you could pick it up. You could, you could do this with it. It's very tough. It's very fibrous. The primary role of the dura mater is that it protects the brain. Beneath the dura mater, you have what is known as the arachnoid mater. And it's referred to as the arachnoid mater because it looks like a spider web. 
and it looks like a spider web because it has uh, tiny blood vessels running all through it. The purpose of the arachnoid mater is largely nutritive, meaning it houses these blood vessels that supplies fresh oxygen and nutrients to the surface of the brain. And beneath the arachnoid mater, you have what is known as the pia mater. Pia mater means delicate mother, and the pia is the deepest layer of cerebral meninges, layer of the cerebral meninges. And essentially the blood vessels from the arachnoid mater pass down through the pia to get to the surface of the brain. And also note that the cerebral, the cerebral meninges envelops the entire central nervous system. So it wraps around your brain, but they also wrap around your spinal cord within your vertebrae. And here on this, on this brain, you can see what's left of the arachnoid mater and the pia. And it's hard to tell them apart in this image. But here you can see cortex, that is the surface of the brain, that is cortex. And if this is the dura mater over here that has been removed, then between there and here, you have the pia and the arachnoid that's still on here. Deep within the brain, you have a system that is known as the cerebrospinal fluid system. The cerebrospinal fluid system produces produces and houses something called cerebrospinal fluid. And the purpose of cerebrospinal fluid is that it performs a function similar, similar to blood flow in that it delivers nutrients to the brain and it flushes out waste products within the brain. So if we look at this image right here, you'll see that there are these two large cavities, and these are known as the lateral ventricles. These are the two largest cavities of the cerebrospinal fluid system. Here you see them drawn a little bit better, and over here you can see the lateral ventricles as you're looking down on them. The lateral ventricles have cells within them known as the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is the part of the cerebral spinal fluid system that produces cerebral spinal fluid. So within the lateral ventricles, you have the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus produces cerebral spinal fluid. So if you look at the lateral ventricles, you can sort of see in this image that the lateral ventricles left and right, they connect at midline at this point right here. That is known as the foramen of Monroe. And it is the point of connection between the lateral ventricles and what is known as the third ventricle that is at midline. The third ventricle, you can see that right here. And if we continue inferiorly, you will see that if we come on south here, that there is what is labeled as the fourth ventricle. And so that space between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle is known as the cerebral aqueduct. And that is the general anatomy of the cerebrospinal fluid system. A few years ago, a research study came out, which was a big deal. It identified why it is that humans need sleep, exactly why it is that 
if we don't sleep, eventually it'll kill us, the lack of sleep. Up until then, no one really knew exactly why humans had to spend half of their lives in sleep. And what these researchers found was that when you go to sleep, the cells of your brain contract a little bit, opens up, opening up more space between them. And the cerebral spinal fluid becomes hyperactive then and starts pumping cerebral spinal fluid between all the cells of your brain, delivering nutrients and flushing out waste products. So this is why your brain works better after you've had a night of good sleep is because you have literally flushed all the waste out of your brain that otherwise is in there messing things up. And this is why if you don't get sleep, if you were not allowed to sleep, eventually you will die from a lack of sleep because the brain will shut down due to the buildup of waste within the cells of the brain. So the cerebral spinal fluid system is really important. And when there's a malfunction of the cerebral spinal fluid system, for instance, it can't absorb old, it can't absorb and get rid of old cerebral spinal fluid, or it's producing too much, or if there's a blockage between one of the ventricles, then you can have a situation where you're getting a buildup of cerebral spinal fluid within the CSF system. And that condition is known as hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a major issue because your brain is within your skull. And if your brain if your CSF system, we'll say your lateral ventricles, they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger because they're filling up with more and more CSF fluid. They're going to be crushing the brain. You're going to have your brain crushed between the, the ventricles and the walls of the skull. And that would kill you pretty quickly. Now, in children, the skull of a child is very cartilaginous meaning that it can expand a good bit to accommodate swelling of the brain and hydrocephalus. But it can only, the skull can only, the cartilaginous skull of a child can only expand so much to accommodate that hydrocephalus before the brain is damaged. And in a, severe enough situation, it will result in the death of a child. Hydrocephalus is remediated medically, surgically, by using what is known as a CSF shunt. And this is a tube that gets placed under the skin, going into the lateral ventricle, and the tube runs under the skin and ends at the kidney. So it drains off excess CSF fluid from the CSF system into the kidney to control hydrocephalus. The CSF shunt involves insertion of a valve that regulates and drains the excess cerebral fluid from a patient's brain. The operation normally takes less than an hour and it is a common procedure done by skilled neurosurgeons. Incisions are made to the head and abdomen. Tubes are then passed through the fatty tissue under the skin. A small hole is made in the skull to allow the ventricular tube to be passed into the lateral ventricle. The peritoneal tube is then placed into the abdomen to allow the fluid to drain. After surgery, the patient will typically spend up to seven days in hospital to ensure the procedure has been successful. A far more effective solution exists in the form of an adjustable valve. This shunt is identical in every respect to the fixed valve, but critically allows the physician to make small adjustments to the pressure setting by using a remote magnetic programmer, eliminating the need for further invasive surgery 
So that's a quick look at what a CSF shunt is. If you work in a hospital, you're going to have lots of individuals. You'll see lots of individuals with CSF shunts. If you um, work with children, especially like medically compromised children, then you're going to see a lot of CSF shunts. Some children will have the CSF shunt placed long term. So you may even see them if you work in an elementary school or middle school. So that's a quick rundown of the cerebral spinal fluid system. So let's look at, we identified the left and the right cerebral hemisphere, divided at midline by the longitudinal fissure. But if we look at the divisions of each cerebral hemisphere, we get into the lobes of the brain. So let's talk about what the lobes of the brain are. So this frontal most portion of your brain, anterior most portion of your brain is known as the frontal lobe. So here's anterior, this is posterior, superior and inferior down here. So your frontal lobe is right here and you have a left and a right frontal lobe Posterior to the frontal lobe, you have the parietal lobe. You have a left and a right parietal lobe. And most posterior on the brain is the occipital lobe. And you have a left and right occipital lobe. And then if I turn the brain laterally here, you use your sylvian fissure. Beneath the sylvian or the lateral fissure, you have the temporal lobe. Your frontal lobe is where all your um, high level cognitive functioning is. This is where your personality is. This is where most of the motor function in your brain originates at the frontal lobe. The frontal lobes have expressive language because Broca's area is down here at the posterior, inferior, left frontal lobe. So frontal lobes do expressive language. Frontal lobes do memory and attention, problem solving. Frontal lobes also do uh, help you regulate your behavior. So social inhibitions, that is frontal lobe. So when you go to a party and when you don't end up dancing on the tables, that's your frontal lobes working. Your temporal lobes down here. Your temporal lobes have, this is where hearing takes place. So when we were talking about the ear, the cochlea, transmitting those electrical signals along the auditory nerve, up to the brain, they're going to the temporal lobes. So temporal lobes do hearing. Specifically, the left temporal lobe does reception of auditory language. So processing of language that you hear. And the temporal lobes also are the primary location in your brain for memory. Because the temporal lobes have each has a part within it known as the hippocampi. And the hippocampi is the part of your temporal lobe that takes what you experience and turns it into a memory. So it's the temporal lobes that create most of your memories. Looking at this coronal slice here of the brain, you see this little curly, this little curl right here at the inferior medial temporal lobe, that is hippocampus right there. Hippocampus is one, hippocampi meaning two. Behind the frontal lobe, above the temporal lobe, you have the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is that part of your brain that is, that is responsible 
for receiving and processing sensory information from the body. Some examples of what that might be is your sense of touch, meaning taction. Your sense of where your body is in space is proprioception, and that comes from sensory receptors that are in your joints. So even with your eyes closed, you can tell where your body is in space. That's your sense of proprioception that comes from your joints that is sent up to the parietal lobe and is processed at the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe does body sensation. The occipital lobe in the back. When you think occipital lobe, think vision. This is the part of your brain that receives information from your eyes and processes that information. 